Hey there, Refuge Church. I'm delighted to be with you once again. We are cruising our way through uh, 1 John. We are in chapter 2 today. We've got to buckle up. Um, there's a lot to look through, so I'm going to pray and kick us off. Father God, I thank you that um, you have all sorts of texts in your word, words of encouragement, words of challenge. I pray that we would have open-handedness to receive um, whatever it is you have for us today to receive. I pray that you would be with me, that my words would be helpful and true, a blessing, um, an encouragement, a service to your people, that they would be understandable and clear as well. Uh, I pray that your spirit would attend to everybody listening, um, that you would minister to us, that we might leave um, this time that we spent together in the text looking more like you, looking more like light, looking more like love, um, and that you would be with us, your word would not return to you void. I ask all these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, here we go. First John chapter 2, verse 18. Children, it is the last hour, and just as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have arisen, by which we know that is, it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out in order that it might be shown that all of them are not of us. You have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all experientially know. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because every lie is not of the truth. Who is the liar except the one who denies that Jesus is the Messiah? This person is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Everyone who denies the Son does not have the Father either. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. As for you, what you have heard from the beginning must remain in you. If what you have heard from the beginning remains in you, you will also remain in the Son and in the Father. This is the promise which he himself promised us, eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning the ones who are trying to deceive you. As for you, the anointing which you receive from him remains in you, and you do not have need that anyone teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and is true and not a lie, just as it taught you, you reside in him. This is the word of the Lord. Okay, so first things first, we have all of this material about the Antichrist. Um, I'm here to deflate anyone's bubbles, maybe um, be a voice of relief as well. Um, if you haven't heard that the Antichrist isn't actually about um, helicopters and the end of the world and Nick Cage, uh, everybody who was raised with the Left Behind series can take a sigh of relief. We are okay. That's, that's not what Antichrist means. What does it mean? Excellent question. So the word Christ, Christos in Greek, just means Messiah, um, Meshiach in Hebrew. So what does that mean? What does the word Messiah mean? The word Messiah means anointed. So folks were anointed with oil um, relatively regularly in the Tanakh, in the first two thirds of our Bibles, um, because they were being marked by God um, to show that they had a special task that they needed to fulfill. So the usual groups that we see receive anointings are palaces, interesting one, um, prophets, priests, and kings. Um, so the palaces one uh, starts in Genesis in the story of Beth El. Um, Yaakov, Jacob, anoints some rocks with oil to show that it is a gateway between heaven and earth. And that's the idea with the prophets, the priests, and the kings as well, that if God is in this upper sphere and we are in this other sphere, that this person is a place where those two spheres come together. Um, why with oil? Why aren't we anointed with cheese or something. Um, oil is thought to be like a concentration of the Holy Spirit. Um, spirit, ruach, also means breath um, or wind, right? And uh, that was a cooling thing, right? All of our uh, biblical literature is written in the ancient Near East, in the desert. It is uh, hot there. And so wind is always a positive, a cooling element. Um, and oil was also used um, to cool people down. If you have a different hair texture than um, many white people, uh, you might know that oil is great for your hair. 
uh, and isn't a gross thing, but so they pour oil on themselves to receive that cooling benefit on a hot day if you had lots of wealth. And so anointing is a version of that. You're taking on this extra concentrated symbol of us, the Holy Spirit to show that you're this gateway between heaven and earth. And that usually happens if you're a prophet, a priest, or a king. We also have lots of prophecies in Tanakh going all the way back to uh, the beginning of Genesis, which say that we uh, were waiting or are waiting, depending if you're Jewish or Christian, um, for an anointed one, a Mashiach, um, that word just means to anoint. Um, who will be the one who will deliver God's people from darkness, um, from sin, from everything, right? In the book of 1 John, we have this like bad stuff pit. There's darkness, uh, there's sin, there's hate in that bucket. Um, the Mashiach, the Messiah, is supposed to be the one who will crush the head of the snake in Genesis, right? Who will deliver us ultimately from all of those things. And so, if that's the context, what on earth does it mean to be an antichrist? If that's what a Christ is, a deliverer, an anointed one, a prophet, priest, or king, who has a special measure of the Holy Spirit, what's the antichrist? Um, rather than being an end of the world metaphor, um, this, we have an a, a antichrist in our biblical literature. We have it in Tanakh, who is a person in the text who receives the anointing of God to be a, spoiler alert, king. And then that anointing is removed. He is unanointed. Um, that person, of course, is the biblical figure of Saul, Shaul. Shaul is picked by God to be the first king of Israel. Israel asks, they cry out for a king um, because uh, everybody else has one. They think it's a good idea. They want one for themselves. And so God meets them where they're at, right? And he um, selects a king. He sends his prophet Samuel or Shmuel to anoint him. Dun, dun, dun. Um, Shaul goes and meets a group of prophets on the road. He has a very charismatic experience. He joins them in prophesying, singing and dancing um, wildly before he's allowed to be king. Um, and so he has a special experience of the spirit and then he's called along on his path to become king. Everything goes well. He gets new recruits. He tries some negotiations. He um, wins some great battles. Things are progressing splendidly. But then uh, by chapter 15 of 1 Samuel, we have the beginning of the very long end for Shaul because um, he will remain king in name for still quite some time. Um, but so he's won this big battle and he was told by God to not keep any loot from the battle because, uh, God's, um, uh, people are supposed to fight to defend themselves only. They're not supposed to take, they're not supposed to gain wealth, um, and treasure, right? By the blood of their enemies. Killing people is not supposed to produce a handy little net good for, um, for their economy, um, and God is so careful about that that he tends to have a huge barrier against anybody taking loot. Um, and that applies to this situation as well um, in 1 Samuel chapter 15. The problem is um, Shaul is a bit of a people pleaser, it seems, because his people um, seem to have asked him if they can keep some of the animals, animals being a, a major wealth producer at that time, right? Um, and he says yes uh, and lets them. And Shmuel shows up, the prophet who anointed him. Uh, and Shaul, you know, shoots his shot on totally lying to God's prophet, which is quite the stance to take. It's a gutsy move. Um, and Shmuel says, I must stop you there. Um, why have you uh, rejected what God told you to do? Um, Maybe God's people had said, look, I just need this, um, you know, oxen to help take care of my family. There's all sorts of reasons we can empathize with Shaul there. But um, this is what uh, Shmuel says to Shaul. He says this, is there as much delight for Yahweh in burnt offerings and sacrifices as there is to listening to and obeying Yahweh? Because um, the king tried telling the prophet he had only kept the animals to sacrifice them. So he says, 
don't really care. Obeying, listening to, and obeying, heeding um, God is more important than doing things for him. He says, look, to listen and obey is better than sacrifice, to give heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, arrogance is like crookedness and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of Yahweh, he has rejected you from kingship. So Saul unanoints himself. He was anointed to be king, but through his actions, through his compromises, through setting aside um, the calling that God has given him, he unanoints himself. This is what it means to be the Antichrist. To be an Antichrist is to have received an anointing and then to choose to set it aside. Um, nothing about helicopters, nothing about the end of the world, right? So what's happening in this context, right? We have a Shaul reference, a King Saul reference, um, but what is John trying to communicate? John is all about drawing these contrasts, big contrasts, big dichotomy kind of guys. So we have light and darkness, right? We're gonna have love and hate. Um, and here we have a contrast between antichrists, because there's plural, it says there's many of them, and anointed ones, right? Because it's the same word, antichrist versus anointed ones. Um, and he says, he expands that just from being, you know, people who aren't king anymore. He expansively includes people who deny that Jesus is Messiah. So what's the context of this? Um, the whole book, as we've mentioned before, the book of 1 John, the letter is written to the Johannine community um, in Turkey. There's about 250,000 people in Ephesus, the main spot uh, where most people lived. John's job is to manage all of these house churches. Um, lots of Jews, lots of non-Jews, um, lots of immigration because it's on the VMRS. So you've got all sorts of people. An endless kerfuffle, right? Less centralization, less control happens if you've got a whole bunch of house churches. There are people who have popped up. Um, who are mingling and lingering and saying, by the way, just putting out there, I don't think that Jesus is Messiah. I don't think he's the prophesied one who came to deliver us and rescue us from the, you know, darkness, sin, death, etc. Um, and they didn't think he was the son of God. So he's not of God. He's not descended from God. He's not the son of God in terms of the cultural message that that included about um, being this counter opposition force to Caesar. He's none of that. He's just a good teacher. Um, and so it's into this context of this division that's happening between these folks that John writes this letter. And he says um, that the folks who are getting in that boat of saying, mm, maybe about Jesus in uh, his divinity are participating and unanointing themselves. Um, and even though John is all about these contrasts and lights and darks uh, and love and hate, um, we can, it can be helpful to also think about this as a spectrum. So, uh, right, we have that great prayer in the Gospels that says, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief, right? That's most of us. Um, I don't claim to perfectly understand the Trinity. <laughs> if I wanted to get a brief, like, breakdown um, video downloaded to my phone from God to explain one thing, it would probably be the Trinity. Um, and this is related to, to that, right? Um so we're all on the spectrum, right, of antichristness. Some of us um, might be in the spot where we're like, you know what, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure what it means that Jesus is God. Um, I still want to study his words, apparently, since you're here on this video. But uh, I don't know that that might be just a historical quirk. Um, and then we have people who are not sure, and sometimes they feel more um, in the Antichrist boat, and sometimes they feel more traditional. Um, many of us have been through big ups and downs in our faith journey. It's not a linear um, experience, right? Healing from trauma is not a linear experience. Reconstruction coming out of deconstruction is also not a linear experience. So just pointing that out that um, some of us might be in that boat and some of us aren't. Um, but what we can see in this passage is that God takes 
what we think about him and what we say about him seriously, right? And we've talked a lot about that as we've um, studied this concept of sin and how it damages our relationships and the seriousness with which God treats sin, even though so often we're a community that says, like, God loves to meet us where we're at. And, um, you know, God's not surprised by our humanity and God's not shocked when we make mistakes. All of that is true. God isn't surprised. And yet he takes us all seriously. And why does he take this seriously? I think it's important to notice he's not saying um, that the problem with being an antichrist is his ego, right? The problem with um, setting aside belief in divinity of Jesus is because he needs praise all day long. He's saying that it's a problem because we have received an anointing from the Holy One and we do have experiential knowledge. Experiential knowledge can be such a gift, um, but it can also be so challenging because our experiences don't always line up logically, right? Um, You can remember, I'm sure, um, a time in your life when your faith felt crystal clear um, and you felt all in on a series of things that you might no longer feel all in on. Um, But that feeling, that experience of knowing Jesus, of experiencing God was still real. And John calls us back to that. So what's the thing about the anointing? What's incredibly exciting to me about this passage is uh, John is implying that all of us have anointing. It's not just Jesus. Um, It's not just people who are now antichrists and are kind of like the Thanoses of the universe going around and destroying things. That's not the vibe. Um, We all have anointings. So who are the three groups that get anointings other than rocks? Um, It was prophets, priests, and kings. Well, we've talked before in our Kingdom of God series that um, we are told that we are to be a kingdom of priests, right? All the way back in Tanakh, all the way um, in 1 Peter, New New Testament, we have this repeated theme. We are supposed to be a kingdom of priests. What does that mean? What have we been anointed to do? If we are anointed, we have an extra concentrated measure of the Holy Spirit in order to be this gateway between heaven and earth for people people to see God in us. Um, What are we supposed to be doing? Um, What is that all about? So this is a passage from Isaiah that we talked about um, again in our Kingdom of God series. I'm going to read what we're supposed to be doing as priests. Um, This is the job description that Jesus uses, and so I feel like it's a pretty good citation. It's from Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord Yahweh is upon me because Yahweh anointed me to bring good news to the downcast. He has sent me to wrap up the brokenhearted, to call to the captives liberty to run quickly, to those who are bound the opening of power, to call the year of the pleasure of Yahweh. The text also says the day of vengeance of our God, but Jesus uh, left that line out. And so feel free to follow in Jesus's footsteps there Um, to comfort those that mourn, to place for the mourners of Zion, to give them a gleaming crown instead of ashes, oil of leaping gladness instead of mourning, a cloak of praise instead of a spirit of dullness, a strong tree of justice planted by Yahweh to bring beauty to rebuild the ancient ruins, to raise up the desolate first places, to make new the desolate cities for eras and eras. Strangers will stand and shepherd your flocks. Sons of immigrants will be your farmers and vine dressers. You will be priests of Yahweh. Ding, ding, ding. They will call you those who wait upon our God. They will say to all of you, of the force of nations you shall eat. And of their glory you will exchange. Instead of shame, a double portion. Instead of disgrace, shouting for joy over your portion. Permanent joy will be for you. For I, Yahweh, love just judgments. I hate robbery rising up. I give wages steadfastly. I cut a permanent covenant for them. Their descendants will be known in the nations. That which comes from them known among the peoples. All that see them will recognize that they are descendants that Yahweh blesses. 
Surely, truly, I will leap for joy in Yahweh. My soul spins for joy in my God, for he has dressed me in garments of deliverance and wrapped me in a cloak of justice. As a groom undertakes a crown and a bride adorns herself with jewels, as the earth brings forth growth and the garden grows her seeds, so the Lord Yahweh will grow justice and praise parallel to all the nations. That's what it is to be a priest. I know that was long, but it's beautiful because there's so much room for the diversity of God's people to find a lane in there. And it's okay if we don't know what our lane is, and it's okay if they change over time. But some of us are people who wrap up the brokenhearted. Some of us are people who call to captives, come out. Um, some of us uh, teach those who are bound how much power they have within themselves. Um, some of us are about uh, giving people crowns instead of ashes, right? Some of us are really good at joy. Some of us are a little bit more spirit of dullness type people, right? There is a broad range of beautiful things happening um, in this passage that we are invited to. And the temptation for our very particular group of people at Refuge Church um, is to be excited about the good things, but without having our source connected to the source, right? The ground of being, um, the living waters, which we are only vessels of. We cannot do those good things from a place of life if we ourselves are not experiencing that life, right? And if we are not interacting with our God as our deliverer, as our rescuer, but then we're trying to enact a rescue for other people, we are going to have a very hard time right? from a place of wholeness, from a place um, of a spilling over of our cup of abundance, right? From a place of the joy set before us. That's the posture that we are invited to try to do this good work in our community. And we miss out when we choose to say no to experiencing God that way, to experiencing Jesus as our Messiah. Um, and so that can be pretty challenging for some of us. Um, and that's why we have church designed to include discussion, um, a place to talk things out, to verbally process with one another. We're all in different shades of the spectrum, right? Because some of us might be absolutely like, oh yeah, divinity of Jesus, no problem. I've never thought otherwise. Um, but we might not live that way. We might live under shame and condemnation and guilt and angst and anxiety constantly, which is not imagining God to be um, one's rescuer, right? And so wherever we are on that spectrum is okay. You're still welcome in our community and at our table to bring all of ourselves and all of our doubts and wrestlings. Um, but we do have an invitation in this passage to say, what are we remaining in? Are we choosing to remain, because it is a choice, in the experiential knowledge that we had at first, right? Revelation says, remember the things you did at first. Um, Jeremiah talks about remembering the husband of our youth, right? Um, we are challenged in this passage to remain in our anointing. And I love John Thurzen, uh, you don't have any need that anyone teach you. <laughs> you already know all the things, church. Um, we've done so much deconstruction and reconstruction together, and I'm sure there'll be more of that and there will be more learning, but, uh, which is a joyful thing along the path ahead of us. And yet we don't need to wait to hear one thing that unlocks everything for us for us to be able to settle in to a place of uh, wrestling with Jesus as our Savior, as our Messiah, as our Deliverer, as our Rescuer. We already know, we've already had the experience, we are called in this section um, to reside in it, that we might experience eternal life, right? We talked about eternal life a couple weeks ago, and now to take it to heaven, a way of living right now um, that is life-giving, that has the full breadth of life in it. That's um, what we're potentially missing out on. Um, when we don't walk in these ways that we've been called to walk. Uh, one last note here. He has this section up at the top that says, they went out from among us because they were not of us. Um, that is a very specific pastoral message that John is giving to a hurting congregation. And we ought never, 
never, ever, ever to use that as a cudgel against other people, right? That's not an invitation um, to say, oh, well, you left us, you finished your deconstruction, we're not in the same place, I guess you were never part of us. Um, that's not an invitation that is here. And if that was used against you, I'm so sorry. Um, that is not an appropriate use of this passage, especially because so often when that's used, it's not around the divinity of Jesus. It's just for any reason under the sun, right? Um, so that's not how this is to be used. How is it supposed to be used? It is when you have undergone immense relational difficulty um, and brokenness and there's been this kind of hashing back and forth that we know was happening in this era in John's churches. Um, and at the end of the day, being able to let that person go and say, this is your choice. Um, you have free will. You have your own independence. You're your own person. And I'm choosing to let you walk in the way that you would like to walk, right? Badgering people eternally um, does not behoove the family of God. Um, and so this is... A message of comfort for the folks who have been left at the end um, to say this was not meant to be it's okay um, and it's not supposed to you be used out of a place of aggression so just wanted to put that out there in this broad spectrum of truth and lies and love and hate and light and darkness and Christ and antichrist, however we behave toward one, one another in this milieu as we're thinking, as we're chewing and we're pondering. The rest of the theme of this book is that we have to love each other, right? Um, that's what really defines one who is of the Father, one who knows God, one who walks with God, one who is in the light. Um, that is the metric, right? Whether we love um, our fellow human being, including our enemies, says Jesus. So that's how we want to shape this conversation and all other conversations. Um, so please, if you haven't yet, or if you haven't, it's been a while, um, you can find our Zoom link if you want to join us online at refugepullman.com. Um, anyone is welcome anywhere in the country. Um, just fill out that form and uh, we'll get back to you. And if you live in the Palouse area, we'd love to see you in person. Come on and join us. Um, there's also a button on that website for giving. We'd love if you could help us out. And thank you so much if you do. That is First John 2, except for the very tippy end. Uh, thanks for joining us. I'm going to pray. God, thank you that you do meet us where we're at. That the fact that we wrestle with our unbelief, belief, does not make us um, better kids in your book or worse kids in your book. We are just your kids. We are loved as we are. And yet, you have also given us a special calling, a list of beautiful things the best mission statement we could ask for about how we're supposed to spend our life on this earth is laid out in that passage in Isaiah. You invite us to beautiful things and we're supposed to do those beautiful things um, that bring us joy and bring others joy under this anointing uh, helped by your spirit because we need help. We don't always know how to do it all by ourselves. I ask that we would be people who are rooted in health, rooted in knowledge of you, experiential knowledge of you, the experience that you are good, knowing that we have a rescuer, we have a savior, we have a person, a parakletos, and when we call, you show up at our right hand. I ask for your kindness that we might experience you that way if it's been a long time and we're not sure if we're broken um, and we're not sure what's wrong that you would show up for us in miraculous ways and that when we see you show up, we would say, yes, I know that is God. Um, I ask for the eyes to see that. I ask for hearts that would be open to that. Um, I just ask that you would um, be the wave of love that is able to knock through all the little structures that we build up in front of you because it feels safer to be back here, to stay intellectual, to stay disconnected. Uh, and I ask that you would help us say yes to being swept away by who you are. I ask that um, 
full of kavana, full of intention, full of hope that you will show up. God, please do not put me to shame. Do not put us to shame. Um, be in the midst of your people, God. Um, we want to be your Christos. We want to be anointed for these beautiful things um, and not to set that aside and miss out, God. And so I pray that your spirit would do her work um, within us as we ponder these things and move throughout the rest of our weeks. I ask you that in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Okay, guys, have a wonderful rest of your week. Bye.